learning strategies through reinforcement learning. So, uh, firstly, what is reinforcement learning? So, in very general terms, it's uh, teaching a program of some sort to perform a task, and in order to for it to learn, it has to keep on trying that task, uh, probably failing, and then learning from its mistakes. So, in some cases, uh, they have like race cars racing on a little 2D map. Uh, completing a lap is a success, crashing is a failure. Sometimes it's a uh, chance of success. So that after it learns, it update the uh, algorithm that it's using, and then it will hopefully perform better, and you repeat the process until it can perform the task uh, relatively well. So here's a very basic example that uh, you probably unknowingly interact with every day. Uh, it's caused quite a bit of controversy in recent news uh, with Facebook as uh, showing an ad to a user. So uh, this is this problem here is also known as the multi-armed bandit problem. So you show an ad to a user and you give a response. Uh, either they'll click on it or they don't click on it. So if they do click on it, algorithm that the server uses will show that ad more times than the users. Uh, if they don't click on it, it will show the ad less frequently. Uh, and then the next step is they show another ad to another user after that they made that update. And then the process continues and hopefully, well for them, they make more money using this. So the reinforcement, uh, implementing any sort of reinforcement learning problem you have three main things you want to consider. One, what kind of input are you adding or using? Uh, two, what kind of response does the uh, program look for? So in the previous slide, it was a click. And uh, lastly, what, how does the program act on that response? In which in that case, is, is more likely to show relevant ads. So uh, for today, I would like to look at the problem of teaching a computer to play board games, and as an additional uh, part of reinforcement learning that isn't as common is I want to be able to learn strategies from it. Something that you could tell a human, hey, you should do this, and then they would be able to follow the same strategy the computer's using. Which... So uh, I did this with two games, and for the first game, I wanted to start off with something a bit simpler. So a game with a few rules, uh, simple turn structure, uh, and overall just relatively uh, easy to describe uh, to a computer uh, is pretty important, as well as uh, one other condition, uh, no easy to do bad moves, where uh, it's like nothing like walking on a tightrope where it's really easy to fall off and impossible to learn. So, First game I simulated is a game called Machi Koro. It's a two to four player game. Uh, it uses dice rolling to determine uh, the outcome of each turn. And player, at the end of each player's turn, they can buy cards that have different effects based on the dice roll. And to win the game, this player simply has to be the first to collect four specific cards. So uh, th these are all the different cards in the game. Uh, on the left hand, these are the cards uh, people buy that will get them uh, more money to buy other cards with. So, lower left, you see a wheat field. Whenever anyone rolls a one, they get a coin. Uh, uh, green card, uh, bakery, if it, on their turn, if they roll a two or a three, they get a coin. And then other cards, like the red cards, you take coins from other players. And on the right side, there are those are the cards that you need to buy to win the game. So one allows you to roll two dice instead of one. Another one increases the amount of money you get from different established or cards. Uh, another allows you a re-roll per turn. And another one lets you take an extra turn if you get a re-roll. Uh, so the turn order is fairly uh, simple. Player rolls the dice. Everyone does different stuff based on the results of the roll. And player who's uh, just rolled the dice can buy one card. And then if there's no winner, you go to the next player. So, uh, for uh, reinforcement learning, uh, there's uh, basically two main inputs I had. Uh, I had the uh, cards the players had and the amount of points they had. 
And the cards on the board are also optional uh, since all the information you need really is uh, from all the cards the players have since it's fixed in the game. So, uh, representing this data, uh, uh, there's, I like to represent data in two ways. First is a way that's easy for a human to read. So, uh, here's some R code uh, which corresponds to the Python code I use, where you have a list. Uh, so, see the, this uh, list contains uh, some data for player one, which is own list, which has coins. And then there's another list within that which has all the different cards and accounts in it. And the same for player two, and then uh, I could write out player three and player four. Uh, but most of the time, a computer is not going to like to read that sort of input when it's constructing a model. Uh, you need to be able to represent it as a uh, numeric factor. So I like to have some constants here. So in this case, uh, just a short example of a card order that's consistent. And a way to serialize that data from uh, nested lists to a bunch of cards. Um, uh, the, the output vector is just a bunch of numbers there, like, uh, yeah, which represents the uh, <coughs> points they have and then the presence of each card. So, uh, when I built this project, I had some uh, main scripts for running the file. So, uh, for the, the game, uh, to run itself, I had game.py. Uh, for all the methods relating to what players do, I had player.py. Um, for the decision, the algorithm in the background, which I'll describe in a moment, I had a file called player.py. And for a bunch of the game's constants, I put that all in a file, constants.py. And making a constants file is a very common thing that you do in a lot of projects in almost every uh, single programming language since you want to organize stuff that uh, won't change and there are common definitions that you don't want to have to keep on uh, repeating. Um, so with these scripts, I decided to uh, import them through uh, another script or as well as an IPython notebook, which I'll also describe, which uh, uses these to run the simulations. And with the simulations, I uh, sent the output into some CSV spreadsheets uh, as well as uh, saving some of the models that I use into this file format called H5. And then with the CSVs, I use R to analyze the results, and which I'll present today. So, uh, what, uh, I can use an internet browser to quickly show. Yep. Um, so, uh, Jupyter Notebooks are actually uh, pretty cool. Uh, so, you can you know, run them in any modern browser. And originally they were for Python, but now they can be used with, like, R and a bunch of other languages. Uh, very useful for sharing uh, code and other visualizations and output. And one thing that's I think is kind of cool and the, that's starting to become more common in the scientific community is that it allows others to replicate your results instead of just relying on your word that the code works. So this is okay, so this is what uh, looks like uh, if you add it to GitHub, it'll actually render it for you, which is nice. So uh, this is uh, the code here that I ran. Uh, then it'll have printed output, and this is longer printed output. And near the bottom, you can see it even lets you print out graphs. And this works the same way in R. You can use ggplot or your favorite plotting package, and it's easy to share your uh, presentations with people on the internet. So the learning process for this game is a little bit more complicated than just the turn order. So uh, you uh, initialize the neural networks, and I'll explain what those are in a minute. Um, so you start a game, the player starts the turn, and the uh, player predicts the chances of winning the game for each possible action. So then the player randomly decides on one of the action, the actions with the better chance of winning being more likely. Then they make that decision, uh, the game state is recorded, uh, added to basically a row of the data frame of what was R. And if the player didn't win, it goes to the next player. If they did, then all the game results are saved. Uh, for all the rows, the uh, win variable uh, is added. 
And then after that, either you can continue uh, with another the game, or you can start training the uh, uh, algorithm that, that it's using to uh, make better decisions. And then after enough time, you uh, will want to discard the data you trained with because the, uh, the computer is no longer acting like it used to, and the data that predicts how much its chances are winning aren't relevant anymore. So uh, that you need to start collecting data uh, or new data. And then you can also decrease the randomness of the player's actions and you have more confidence in their decisions. And, uh, that's usually done relatively slowly, uh, so if the data is still relevant when they're training. So a uh, quick uh, uh, introduction to neural networks. So you may have heard the, like things about like, deep learning neural networks in the news or a bunch of like science articles now. And these are, this is a machine learning algorithm that's inspired by brain neuron architecture. Uh, it's very popular because it can solve complex problems such as uh, image recognition, uh, voice uh, recognition, and pretty much any kind of complicated problem that you can imagine. And it can take arbitrary numeric input. Um, you can layer them on top of each other. Uh, the main problem with neural networks in many cases is that you don't know exactly what the model does. Uh, there could be like millions and millions or even billions of uh, variables representing the inner workings of it, and no human can decipher what that means. But for this application, it's fine because we're not concerned with how exactly it works. Uh, but I will give you, an, I give you a toy example of a very uh, simple type of neural network problem that I often have, which is, uh, should I buy it? Uh, so, so, when I buy a drink, uh, there's three questions that I ask myself. One, is the drink too expensive? Two, is it too unhealthy? And three, is it really tasty? So, if it's expensive, I'm less likely to buy it. It's unhealthy, less likely. If it's tasty, I'm more likely. Um, this, I can, I can sort of, uh, uh, simplify this by uh, describing it as a flowchart with a point system. So if it's too expensive, then I'll give it minus one points. Uh, if it's too unhealthy, minus one point. And if it's tasty, give it one point. And this is a slightly simpler way of describing that graph here. Uh, and if the point value is one, uh, then I'll buy the soda. If it's less than one, then I won't. So, uh, this is kind of like an example of a uh, one-layer uh, neural network. You have your too expensive, too unhealthy, and tasty variables, and you go into the decision of whether or not you want to buy it. So, so you can, I can ask more, less subjective uh, questions uh, based on the data. And this is adding a second layer to the neural network. Uh, so, is the soda in the bottle? Uh, if it is, then that means it's more expensive. Um, if I'm on a diet, then it decreases the threshold for unhealthiness. Um, but if it is a diet soda, it is healthier, but it also tastes worse. So you see how there's a, these can uh, interact between layers. So uh, this is a very uh, simple example of how a neural network works. Wait, can you get back to someone? Yes. So like, how did you, sorry, back in one. Yeah. How did you, why did you decide negative one, zero, negative one, zero, one, positive one, zero? Why not just one, zero, one, zero, one, zero? So, uh, for these, uh, the negative one means that it decreases the score, so it works against buying a score. And then the, uh, I put the uh, no answers there because there's two possible options, yes or no. Uh, but in all the cases, no doesn't have any influence uh, of the... I just said it's a zero since that's easier to simplify. Does that answer the question? Okay. Okay. So, uh, one thing that I wanted to look at also is uh, measuring the performance of the model. So, there's two different uh, things I've looked at. One, 
how many turns does the AI take to complete the game. Uh, if it completes it faster, then it's definitely being more efficient. Uh, that alone isn't uh, determined performance because it is competing against other players and they can try to uh, make moves to prevent the other players from doing this well. Uh, but I did test the AI against uh, less well-trained uh, and random untrained AIs and it won 98.5% of the games. So performance for a game that, like this, which is fairly random, is pretty good. So uh, here, this is the only time I used Python for visualization. Uh, you don't recognize these types of uh, style of this graph, but I looked at the number of turns it took for the game to complete before I trained the AI and afterwards. And initially it took about 110 turns, or 27 per player. Uh, then it was almost twice as fast after I trained. So that was generally good results there. Uh, then after that, I started to look at more of what kind of uh, uh, strategies the computer made. So one, uh, one of the biggest questions in the game is how are you going to build like the major objectives? So they, they, their costs are vastly different. One, you know, four points, ten points, sixteen points, and twenty-two points. And early on, you don't usually. You can't usually afford the most expensive buildings. But it turned out that there was a very specific building order that was most common. And the top six orders all started with a building that increased the value or amount of money you get from several of your cards called the shopping mall. And most of the build orders did have some appearance in here, but some of them were a lot less popular. So if I were to suggest to someone, like, the game, what strategy should I go with? I would say build a shopping mall, radio tower, a station, and an amusement park. And I also looked at how quickly it took them to uh, finish the game based on these different build orders. And uh, the main interesting thing I saw here is that if they build a radio tower, the thing that lets you re-roll the dice each turn you roll, uh, if they build that first, the game becomes much faster. So, but that's usually you don't have the opportunity for that because you need to get really lucky with your dice rolls. And one other thing which led me to believe that this wasn't a very good game was uh, I looked at how the turn order affected your chances of winning. And if you're the first player to start the game, you have a little bit over a 30% chance of winning. Uh, if you're second player, you still have a bit over. 27% chance of winning, but if you're the third or fourth player, your chances of winning are a lot lower. And uh, this isn't a very good feature of a board game since you want these to be roughly. So that was not as much of a strategy as more of a uh, observation about the game itself. And one other thing I looked at is what they build at different phases of the game, uh, and. It, Basically, you build like a, regardless of what order you're building it, you build, generally build the same buildings by a certain time. It's a little bit tricky to view this, but uh, I have this as an animated uh, <coughs> uh, showing the different cards that people have in various phases of the game if they won the game. And then also what the differences in buildings were between the winners and the losers. So any of the cards that were uh, that you can see going out to the right, those are good ones to build. Any ones going out to the left, you probably don't want to build those. And you know, when half, when almost half the cards in the game aren't viable at all, that's another feature of I think uh, that game. Not to say that it isn't fun, but just from a game uh, design perspective. And then these are. Uh, this title of this slide, but this is just the average number owned by the uh, <coughs> uh, when our, oh, uh, play facing AI uh, that are untrained, and that's what you should prioritize against players who don't know what they're doing. So if you're facing someone new to the game and you want to be mean to them, uh, this is what you should try to build. So uh, before I go on to the next game, uh, I thought I'd do a little bit of a comparison between the languages I use for this project. So, 
with Python, it was a lot easier to represent more complicated data structures. Uh, the problems with naming functions are less common since R tends to import everything it can. It has, um, well, I, I don't even know all the names of the R functions that are available by default. And I know most of them with Python. And Python itself is better for general programming tasks. Um, but R has two major advantages. One is a lot easier to work with regular data, since that's one of the primary considerations that was made when it was designed, and especially with summarizing data, which is how I do most of these visualizations. And yeah, visualizations in R are a lot, it's a lot easier to make uh, very beautiful visualizations in R. And if they're not animated or anything, I almost always recommend R. So the second game I decided to uh, work with is called Splendor. Uh, I have a copy here for anyone who wants to look at it afterwards. Uh, so this game has relatively simple rules, but it has a bit more complicated planning involved. And the objects on the board, they're a little bit more complex. And, but this game has uh, points instead of uh, Cart, yeah, it has a point system that determines the winner instead of having to buy a certain number of cards to determine the winner. So this gives it an easier to find short term goal. So uh, Splendor rules are relatively simple. Each turn you can take uh, one action. Uh, five piles of gems that you can take uh, from normally uh, the green, white, blue, black, and red. And you can take two gems from one pile if it has enough, uh, four or more gems left in it. You can three, take three gems from different piles. Alternatively, you can reserve a card from the board and take a gold uh, gem on the right that acts as any kind of uh, colors. And also, you can purchase a card. So you see that each of these cards uh, has a, some of them have numbers at the top. Uh, these are how many points they're worth. Uh, they have uh, color on the right here, or gem on the right, and uh, this basically reduces the cost of all other cards you purchase by one of this color. And then cost is in these colors here in the numbers, so this costs one blue, one green, one red, one black. And if you have, say, uh, this card for example, which is black, this would cost one less black. Uh, so, a general strategy, you want to get the cheaper cards so that it's easier to buy more of the more expensive cards later. And uh, one other uh, uh, feature of the game that makes it more interesting is the uh, objectives or the noble cards here. Uh, so, these are all worth three points, and you're awarded them once you collect that many uh, cards of that color. So, one of the far left, you get three points when you get four black and four white. So that, that is the sort of long-term planning uh, that the AI has to take into consideration since it takes more than like, say, at least 15 turns to start getting those. So I had, when I started doing this project, I had to apply some lessons I learned from previous attempts. So there are a couple other games I tried uh, simulating called Ticket to Ride and Seller's Catan. Uh, but uh, those games were a lot more complex, and it was a lot harder for the computer to figure out how to uh, complete their objectives. So, uh, I, I don't, and for every project I do, uh, there's uh, sometimes another project that I tried doing, uh, didn't successfully complete, but I took some lessons I learned from that to apply to my next uh, project. It's simpler. So, uh, in this game, one thing I did is I decided to look at uh, more things than just winning the game. I decided to look how many points uh, the player would have in one turn, three turns, and five turns. So for one turn, that's a short-term goal, and then three turns, uh, turns, it's more of a little, little bit less of a short-term objective, and in five turns, it's closer to long-term planning. And obviously, winning the game is the longest-term planning you can get. Uh, but sometimes, topic, nudging it in that direction is kind of hard, so you need to give it some short-term goals as well as long-term goals. And there's also uh, 
uh, an embedded representation uh, that I gave a lot of the cards so that they would all appear very similar uh, as inputs to the model that I use. I'll explain what that means uh, in the next slide, but basically it's representing complex objects is just a few numbers. And I also uh, limited the number of models I used, uh, so I changed the way that I represented the data. So in the previous uh, example, Machi Koro, I had it be action be represented as its own vector. In this, uh, or its, its own like variables. But in this uh, project, what I did is I represent, I predicted the outcome of each action, this action. So if you bought a card, it, the input vector was just the game with that card missing and you having that card instead of the action. So uh, before, oh, before I talk about the embedded, I'll talk about the objectives. Uh, it's a little bit of math uh, here, uh, but essentially the four scores I used, uh, these were the numeric uh, values. So I added a little bit of a benefit of having cards owned and a little bit of benefit of having more gems in your stockpile. Uh, but yeah, the, the main, main thing the computer tried to do was increase the amount of points we got. And uh, for different stages of training, I use different some way in some of these scores. Um, it's completely arbitrary, but generally you, you want to start with higher weight scores, with short term goals first, and move on to the longer term goals. And then uh, the probability of taking action. This is the last bit of uh, math you'll see. Uh, you use, uh, this is uh, basically inspired by a physics distribution called the Boltzmann distribution where you take uh, the exponential of the score divided by a temperature uh, parameter and then divide it over all of the other scores divided by that. And uh, on the right you can see a little bit of our code that describes how this works. So say that you had a predicted score of 1 and 2. So the probability with a temperature of 1 is 26-27% uh, to 27 chance of taking the first action and 73% chance of the second action. Um, if you increase the temperature, you're increasing the randomness, and it's about 45 <coughs> 55%. And if you decrease the temperature, you uh, decrease the randomness, so it's less than 1% and over 99%. And that's, uh, that's essentially how the decision-making process works with the you know, AI. So with the embedded representation, I thought this was kind of a fun little uh, thing you can do. Uh, that's uh, relatively common with uh, images is that you can represent different images as like few numbers. So uh, I got some images. I think I actually drew all of these on uh, my iPad. Uh, you, you can draw uh, represent these images as four different vectors. So uh, you, you have images that are green. Do they have arms? Do they have wings? And do they have teeth? So you have like an elf. Let's try drawing an elf at least. It's green as arms, and then we had a dragon that also had arms. That, so it's green arms and wings, and then another dragon, but with just wings and teeth, and then a pineapple, so it's green. And if you wanted to, say, use these as like variables in a model, so you say you have like pictures or something, uh, if you're, say, trying to predict um, like a but well, yeah, we'll say what kind of images these are. Uh, knowing knowing uh, these variables, like you'd be able to classify them a lot easier using these than having to build up your own model to start with all the different pixels. And you know, the neural network uh, you oftentimes makes uh, simplifications sort of like this, but uh, it's not 100% human readable. It's not 100% precise, but it's approximate. So. Yeah, the tra same training strategy is pretty much the same as before. You simulate the game many times, you train the models, and then you can either simulate again, or you can save the models, uh, update the weights and temperature, and then you clear the history. So, uh, in order to determine <coughs> how effective uh, the uh, training was, 
I took the uh, networks that were trained after two, uh, six, and 12 rounds of training. And I decided to uh, put them, uh, have them basically fight each other. Um, so I would have, say, someone, a player after two rounds face three players that had at least, uh, or had six rounds of training. And then I also had players uh, who had the same number of rounds of training but playing against each other. And that's, even that, that's a better way of looking at what kind of strategies they're using. Uh, since when they are trained, uh, they aren't trained against players with a different number of rounds of training. So I looked at the win rates of these, and it uh, looks like after uh, six rounds of training, it performs significantly better than after two rounds of training. So a uh, uh, single player uh, with uh, six rounds of training, one against three players with two rounds of training 40% of the time. And if we're saying you'd expect around 25% of the time. Uh, with uh, two rounds of, uh, with 12 rounds of training was slightly higher, uh, but I did not notice that much of a difference between 6 and 12 rounds of training. So I think that what the training that I did give it only work, uh, helped it up to a certain point, and I would need to uh, reevaluate how it uh, works in the future. So I did, uh, one thing I wanted to look at is uh, how many turns did it take between the rounds of training, and it did not look like there is a huge difference. So players aren't playing faster, so they're getting that much faster when they're trained more. Uh, they're, it's, it seems like they're choosing ways that will help, like, uh, under, they're trying to undercut each other. They're trying to uh, make decisions that will get them the best result in spite of the others trying to do the same. Uh, and one thing I noticed between their strategies is that uh, the, after six and twelve rounds of training, uh, the AI had a much uh, higher chance of gaining multiple objectives per, per game. Uh, so there's a total of five by default, but usually it's uh, tricky enough to get one. But even the two-round player knew that they were uh, relatively important to get. And uh, and then, so there are three different tiers of cards, uh, different, so tier one is the least expensive, tier three is the most expensive, and uh, it seemed there wasn't too much of a difference except uh, more of the players that uh, were, were had more rounds of training, but probably got the more cheaper cards to complete the objective faster, uh, since they, they still count as one card of a color, but they cost less uh, objectives. So, uh, currently not 100% done with this, but uh, I started evaluating different uh, obstacles that I came across and some possible solutions. So, one of the big problems with this is that training is really slow. Um, the, the neural network algorithm that trains really, really quickly. The big problem is that the simulations themselves take a long time. It's about 8 to 10 seconds per game. So, if I want to do like a lot of training, that can be about 300 to 400 games per hour, which is not a lot when you need uh, thousands of these to be able to uh, get like a good idea of the model. So one thing I can do is I can increase my RAM, which is computer memory, which allows me to run multiple simulations at the same time, which will increase my batch size. Unfortunately, RAM is kind of expensive right now, uh, but another workaround is just spending more time computing these. Uh, another thing I did notice is that, as I mentioned before, the AI definitely uh, does not improve after a certain number of rounds of training. So it will work really well with these uh, short-term objectives and even uh, some of like, the more medium-term objectives of uh, three and uh, five points and three and five turns. But uh, one thing I think that it could use is uh, metrics that not only describe how many points it has, but how many points it has versus other players. Uh, that was a big advantage that the more advanced AIs had against the less trained ones that they knew how to 
uh, make moves that gave them an advantage over the other ones. But the way that I describe the variables that I'm trying to model, it can only carry it so far. Um, and then, okay, that was, okay, that's uh, uh, the end of my presentation. I just have some extra resources at the end here. And I believe there are some uh, prepared questions.